During my time as a Jehovah's Witness, I spent over 5,000 hours out on the ministry. The overwhelming majority of people know that Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to leave magazines, trying to start spiritual conversations, with the eventual goal being conversion and baptism. But what those people don't know is what Jehovah's Witnesses say about them once they've left their door. I believe that if people knew what they said, they would be truly shocked. It's important to state here that everything that Matt and I say in these clips after the door are either expressions that we ourselves said or statements that we heard other Jehovah's Witnesses say while out on the ministry. While we didn't set out with the intention of making any of these clips actively humorous, that seemed to be the natural byproduct. As the saying goes, comedy is tragedy plus time. Oh, someone's in. Hello? Speak up a bit. Hello? Leave my delivery by the back door, please. Delivery? Um, did you want us to leave our magazine by the back door? Oh, I thought you were my delivery. No, uh, Matthew and I are leaving a magazine with you and your neighbours today. Neighbours? I don't have any neighbours. Well, um, the, the, the people who live closest to you down, down the lanes. In a world which is full of such bad news, wickedness and suffering, we're, we're offering people opportunity to have some good news. Oh, no, no, no. Are you Jehovah's? Uh, yeah, we're, we're a couple of local Jehovah's Witnesses. No, no. My husband maintains the gardens at the local church, so we're quite happy. Thank you. Have a good day. I mean, Harrison, look at all of this. The house, the gardens. I mean, there's enough room for a swimming pool and a five-a-side football match with the brothers when I invite them over for a barbecue. On a day like today, could you imagine how nice that would be? Incredible. But, Matthew 6, 24, you cannot slave for two, two masters. masters. You'll love the one, hate the other. We must slave only for Jehovah. Mm. But she didn't deserve any of this. This garden, the house, the, the chickens, the scenery, it'll all be mine in the new system. But wait. It was going to be mine. Harrison, can we flip a coin for it? The entire narrative that we hear growing up as a Jehovah's Witness is you need to learn to be content. Don't strive to attain lots of material possessions in this system. Don't be materialistic. But is this clip tapping into the real materialism that the vast majority of humans have? Well, I think it does shine an interesting spotlight, that, that whole clip there, really. And it, it kind of asks the question, is, you know, one of the se seven deadly sins, is greed in itself bad? Do we feel it? Do we indulge it in, you know, the Jehovah's Witness culture? And the truth is, we do indulge it. I know that we try to obfuscate it, we, we say it's wrong, it's, it's bad, but it's, it's, it's truly not. Because at the end of the day, we're showing up, you know, to a, to, to a luxury property or, or, or a nice place and we're visualising. It's like, don't worry, Jehovah, he's going to come in. He's going to decimate Earth's population. I can then run in and I can indulge and hijack all of the wealth of a genocided population. I can jump into the Porsche 911 with my brand new Panda, <laughs> run over the cadaver in the drive, boom, boom, pff, and off into the sunset for all of eternity. And I've done nothing to work for it. You're tapping into a very interesting layer there. It's almost like a pack of vultures in the trees looking down on a very aged lion that's taking its last steps before then keeling over and dying. And they all just swoop in. This sense of contentment, lack of materialism, it's only a thin veil. And when you remove the veil, you realise that it's just a mask to hide the real ugly nature of their own humanity. Yes, exactly. Because I mean, if, 
not being materialistic was truly inculcated into their being, me and you would have strutted up to that property and we would have been disgusted. We would have been like, look at this materialistic lifestyle. This needs to be done away with. Let's knock it all down, build ourselves a couple of single story mud huts and defecate in the grass. <laughs> But that's simply not the case, and that's not the picture that's depicted in paradise, is it? We're, we're all wearing clothes, chinos, everyone's got a pair of chinos. <laughs> how, is, how is this being made? We're not in visual, visualizing a simple life for ourselves. So have you heard of the ministry song? There's a ministry song? There's a ministry song. So it's not on JW.org or anything like that. But when I was about 13, a brother in my former congregation taught it me and I've just never forgot it. Okay, well, let's hear it. Oh, you, you want to hear it now? Right now. I've not done any of my vocal warm-ups or anything, but, um, okay, um, good morning, good morning. We're just calling to tell you that you're going to die. But if you're to listen to what we got to say, everlasting life will come your way. Jazz hands. I love it. You like it? Yes, you need to write down those lyrics so I can say it to the brothers back at my congregation. Uh, I'll write down the lyrics for you. I'm so glad you Thank like you. it. Not many people do. If you're going to talk to me, talk to me in the same room. Sounds lively in there. I don't talk about cats. I talk about lots of other things. Can I help you? Uh, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, no, it's the God Squad again. I told him to go away once before. So, you know who we are then? I know who you are. Your colleagues have been round here before and I've told them to sod off and I want you to sod off too. Wow. I mean, interesting conversation. <laughs> I know. You know what? Under the cover of darkness, I'm going to get eggs and I'm going to chuck them all over his house. Matt, as much as we want to do that sort of thing, you know, I'd love to come back and throw eggs. But remember, Romans 12. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says who? Jehovah. Jehovah. All right, but can you imagine his face at Armageddon? I know. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean any of those horrible words. Well, too late, mate. You know what? We should go back and sing him the song. The ministry song? The ministry song. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're just cool. Every Jehovah's Witness will agree that the ministry song perfectly summarises their entire belief system, the whole reason they're going round. Mm. Good morning, good morning. We're just calling to tell you that you're going to die. Listen to what we've got to say and you'll attain everlasting life. Everlasting life will come your way. That is an incredible song, an incredible message for a, an elder in a congregation to be teaching me when I was about 12 or 13 years old on the ministry. But it does make you think, why are we behind the householders' backs singing this song to each other and having a laugh about this? But actually, to their face, we're completely different. We would never consider singing that song to them. So why is that? I don't know truly what it is, but Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, we, we do have this natural inclination to, to sugarcoat our beliefs because we know that if we were to just give them to the householder directly, they would be so completely unpalatable that the likelihood of, of you know, a very aggressive response coming back would be almost guaranteed. Mm -hmm. You know what, speaking of aggressive, aggressive responses, how did, you know, how did they affect you? They didn't, they never had a big impact on me personally. What about you? Well, for me, they would always whip me up into some kind of power fantasy where, I mean, you kind of seen it at the end of the video where you're almost riding on the locks of Jehovah as if he was a kaiju coming out of the ocean, decimating the US military. <laughs> and you're kind of saying, I bet you listened to me now. Yeah. And you kind of use this power fantasy as a mental coping mechanism for, you know, being belittled and, and shamed. Because obviously we can't return the same hatred, the same anger. We when someone says sod off, we can't go, no, you sod off and then slam the door. That, that is the opposite of what we're instructed to do. But when someone is that rude, in fact, when someone is, is much worse than that, much more aggressive, which in my years on the ministry I experienced, 
It simply serves to reinforce the fact that I am a true Christian. I am being persecuted because I am a true follower of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. No matter what people say, it's to be expected. They're worldly, they're aggressive, they're drunk, they're gamblers, they're smokers. And so it completely lives up to the stereotypical image, a stereotypical picture that's often portrayed of worldly people in the Jehovah's Witness literature. Exactly. We know that we originate with God, but the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. Wow, it's quite amazing because no one's ever shown me that scripture before, but it makes complete sense. Well, you know what? If I didn't have a, a sound, logical answer to the question you posed, I wouldn't be here. In fact, tomorrow at the Kingdom Hall, there is a talk on this exact topic. It will go into much better detail and you'll be able to meet brothers and sisters from our congregation too. I bet that sounds great, but tomorrow doesn't work for me, I'm afraid. I'm going out all afternoon. Afternoon? Yeah. No worries. Th that sounds perfect. You'll be able to come to it because it's a morning meeting, you see. Oh, yeah. So you'll be able to come to the meeting in the morning. You'll be able to come back, have a wash, get changed. Oh. And Sorry, one minute. Hello. Hey, Debs. Right, OK. I'm really sorry, guys. It's the office. Oh, I'm going to have to go, I'm afraid. But I'll, I'll catch you next time, if that's OK. Thanks. Bye. Do you know who's listening to that conversation? Satan. Satan. He always finds a way of dragging honest-hearted people away from the doorstep, don't you think? Yeah. But do you know what, Harrison? At least he made your hope smile. <laughs> I often say that a religion such as Jehovah's Witnesses both draws in narcissistic individuals and also installs a high level of narcissism within you from a very young age. Every decision you make, even sometimes your thoughts, are either going to make Jehovah happy and Satan sad or Satan happy and Jehovah sad. You are at the centre of a battle for universal sovereignty. And sometimes in our ministry, we genuinely believe that of course we were out there making Jehovah happy, but Satan was watching on and he would do anything to scupper the chances of us bringing in a new disciple. Exactly. I mean, it could be anything from a baby crying, a dog barking, escaping, a cat, the plumber's just arrived, there's a severe weather warning, a pipe's just burst. These aren't just circumstances. These things have been manufactured up by Beelzebub and his legion of demons. As if he gets a phone call every time we're at the door and he's there like, a, bro a brother's talking to Janice in number 33. And he just grabs one of them and just tosses them out of his cave. And then he goes back and enjoys some heavy metal music or something, whatever Beelzebub likes to do in his spare time. We we draw that as actually the most logical conclusion instead of something like perhaps this person is just very agreeable they're trying to let us down softly or maybe they're just very busy mm -hmm. but actually no we draw the logical conclusion of of um well it's the illogical conclusion we draw that saying no no, no it's a um omnipotent, omnipresent, evil spirit creature that keeps thwarting every attempt for me to bring somebody in to the loving arms of Jehovah's organization. And if you think about our success rate over all the years that we were out in the ministry, Satan did a very good job. He did an excellent job. In fact, he had a 100% success rate in my life. <laughs> so he's that good. But these characters, Jehovah God, Satan, the devil, they are so real to us when we're out on the ministry that they're, they're far more real than the person we're working alongside. And obviously, once you come out of that religion and you start to realize that, well, all of this is fictional, none of it's true, you then look back in and it's so difficult to try and talk to any believer or even your own family in any sense of, of doubt or question. Because if it's a choice between you Harrison Coe, the who are you? You're just, you're just a human, you're made of flesh and blood. Or Jehovah God, the most consistent real being in their life and in or outside the universe, then they're gonna choose Jehovah their best friend every time. I mean, I saw you at the meeting talking to Caitlin. Yeah. Is there anything there? No, mate, there isn't. It's, oh. I think she hasn't been out of the ministry a couple of times and I think we've got different spiritual goals. 
Well, that's it. You, you do need to find someone who matches your spiritual level of ambition. Someone who wants to oh, pioneer. Dearly. I mean, the convention's coming up, so there's always an opportunity. I don't know, Harrison. I don't think I'm ready for marriage. Well, I used to say the same thing. I used to say to myself, well, let's get the ski school out the way. Let's serve where the need's greater. Um, late 20s, early 30s. And then I'll be ready to find love. But life never works like that. Love comes at the most unexpected time. Well, you never know. Hi boys, how can I help you? Uh, uh, we, we have these uh, magazines, would you, would you like one? Uh, I mean, I'll take it, but I'm not really religious. Well, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Oh, okay boys, well, thank you for coming. Gosh darn it, I didn't get her name. You're thinking of calling back on her? Of course I'm thinking of calling back on her. The organisation says to call back even on a smile. I'm not sure she did. She did. She's interested. I'm thinking about starting a doorstep study with her. Tomorrow even. A doorstep study tomorrow? Just, Matt, just whatever you do, take along a sister or, or a spiritually mature brother, okay? The, the spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. I'm not sure anyone has ever been that forward on the ministry. But this scenario, incredibly, is based on a real life story of my mum and dad. They first laid eyes on each other, standing at either side of the door. Looking back, my mum says that she wasn't interested in the message whatsoever, but she was interested in the handsome young man standing at her doorstep, that being my dad. Needless to say that growing up, both my family and the congregation reminded me, when you find someone who is interested in the message, who we perceive to be attractive, don't make the mistake of calling back by yourself. Don't do a solo return visit. Take along someone who is spiritually mature, whether it be a brother or ideally a sister. The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. But Matt, in terms of your presentation itself, why was it so short? Well, I guess what was happening in that uh, pause, whatever you want to say, that indiscernible sound that I make, is me being slapped in the face with a very, very unfortunate reality that due to my religious upbringing, I can go through the entire catalogue of my experiences and still fail to construct a word to even begin to formulate a sentence that could make me relatable to one of my peers. Mm. And that... That is a tragedy in a way, and that kind of, that, that isolation, that loneliness, that, that inability to connect to normal people in society is sometimes a void that has been already carved out of our, our, our cast before we were moulded, and it can follow us even when we leave the organisation. You were saying to me the other day about how you used to go on the ministry down the south of England, Falmouth, where your friends were living from school. Yeah, it was a tragedy. <laughs> and you'd go door to door and your presentation, you'd have prepared lots of different verses, but in reality? They would, they would, they would fade away. I mean, yes, sometimes, you know, you'd have this amazing pre-rehearsed -re pre presentation. And when an older person was at the door, you know, you could, you could rattle it out. But when it was somebody of your own group, it's like I said, is you were, you were hit with that reality because you so desperately you know, in the beginning, you, you, you parent bond. But when you go to school, most Jehovah's Witnesses do go to a normal school. You do have that desire to peer bond and you want to bond with the person that's within your age bracket on the other side of the door. You don't want to be ridiculed. You don't want to be separated. You don't want somebody to find an excuse to make you the other, the different, because nine times out of 10, being the other and the different is a very negative thing. I was exactly the same. When I was on the ministry, I'd have a presentation with about three or four verses prepared. I'm gonna go from here to Genesis, to Psalms, back to Genesis, to Revelation. I'm gonna start a Bible study. Someone from the gym uh, opens the door and I'm there like, hey bro, how's it going? Yeah, exactly. We're just, no, we're just leaving a magazine. It's cool, no, no need for a conversation. Catch you at the gym, but it completely changes 
uh, how you're going to go about recruiting members. It, it's no longer about recruitment. It's about fitting in. Mm. The challenge, though, is when someone we perceive as being attractive comes to the door. Because as a young Jehovah's Witness, you're bombarded with this message that sexuality of, of any nature is negative. It's got its place later on in life. But for the next 10, 20 years, you need to repress yourself. You need to stick yourself in a box. Do not touch anything. Do not think about anything because that would be pleasing Satan. The gap between where Jehovah's Witness now is meant to be in terms of their non-sexual nature and where the world, the evil world and their provocative music videos, the scenes in films and TV programs and where people's minds are at on the ministry, the gap is widening day by day. Exactly. I mean, people people now are, are, are worlds apart when you when you separate it from a, from an average Jehovah's Witness. Because, like you said, in those informative years when you're growing up, you're developing, you're going through puberty, you're finding out where you're fitting in. Not only does does it, you know an average everyday person you know struggle to do that, it's having to then do that in addition to your parents perpetually sabotaging you and every attempt you make to discover yourself sexually you know, in, in that environment. And then it just leads to this complete mix match where you have, you know, we have one, you know, one group of people, you know, in our culture, in our Western culture, you know, people are very sexually liberal now. You can express yourself sexually far, far more, uh, with far more freedom than you used to be able to. And a Jehovah's Witness is, is kind of still trying to discover himself. So when you do meet somebody, let's say that you are attracted to in the ministry or somebody at work or at school, it's, you know, trying to bridge that gap. It's like almost like you're talking an alien language. Or they're like, well, you know, we need to get married. <laughs> you know, this is, this, is, this is marriage now. She touched my arm. Yeah, Where's the engagement ring? Where's the engagement <laughs> ring? Because, because everything, everything has to be uh, with the view of eternity. Mm. You know, this is, this is forever. You know, I can't find out who I like. You know, this, this, is, this is the person. This is Jane. She's the closest person to me. Jane's going to do, and Jane's going to be forever. It's, uh... You didn't invite me back on that return visit. Please tell me that you didn't go by yourself. Of course not. Of course not. What would you say is the key to finding lasting happiness in life? I would say finding lasting happiness comes from God, but it would really come from having a deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, it's just, it's very rare to find someone who says that nowadays. Well, it's to be expected, to be honest, because Jesus did prophesy that the love of the greater number would grow cold eventually. Mm. Sorry, what, um, what church are you guys from? We're local Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Is it true that you guys believe that only 144,000 go to heaven? That's correct, yes. Why is that? What? It states it clearly in the Bible. Let me show you. It's in the book of Revelation. So if you read the Gospels alone, would you guys say that you're going to heaven? The Gospels alone? It, it's just funny you mention it because it feels like you took a verse from Revelation and cherry-picked it to then reinterpret the rest of the Gospels. I think it just, it's got a completely different meaning. I've not heard that one before. Um, I'd, I'd like to do some more research on the topic. Maybe, maybe go away and I could come back another time with, with a more precise answer to the point that you've raised. Yeah, sure, that's fine with me. Fantastic. Now, in the meantime, I would like to leave you one of these brochures. It's called Good News from God. In particular, point seven. What is God's kingdom? I think you'll really enjoy a read of this. Hmm, okay. Can I, uh interest you guys in this? Um, CD Al? Yes, I'm, I'm a member of the uh, Church for the Disciples of the Lord. We're just, um, just down on Broadway Lane, actually. You guys should come on Thursday night, check it out. It's, uh, it's really nice, really friendly. Get to meet the congregation. Um, there's, potentially, potentially. Um, thank you for your time. Take you care. Got, take care, guys, thank you. C.D. Al. More like Babylon the Great. <laughs> God.
garbage. Garbage. When we were Jehovah's Witnesses, what would the ideal householder be like? Well, the ideal householder is just this blank slate that opens the door and then I just dictate my message to. I don't care what they believe. I'm there to steamroll over whatever preconceived notions they have about reality and preach them the, the truth of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. I want them to confirm my confirmation bias and that clip there kind of highlights you know sort of our religious hip hypocrisy in a way due to the you know the sheer certainty and in intolerance they have for other religions mm. i think the best way of illustrating this is for a young jehovah's witness their parents every day give them a chocolate bar and they say this is the best chocolate bar mm. in the world the only true chocolate bar all the others they have to have this poison in them it's poison it kills people it's horrific and the child's like oh Oh, thank goodness I've got, I've got the one true chocolate bar. Every day eats the chocolate bar, goes into a shop, sees all the others, but knows they're poison. Only the idiots would eat those. Growing up, obviously my, my mum has never been a baptised Jehovah's Witness, so I wasn't raised like that at my mum's house. My dad was. So at school, with regard to Christmas time, I would go to the local church, but already that sense of intolerance for other religion and, and the, the buildings these pagan symbols of satanic worship, I would go in there and I'd already had this preconceived idea that this was horrific, this was horrible. I wasn't given a fair chance. These, these religions didn't have an opportunity to present themselves to me in a fair way in which I looked at the Jehovah's Witness religion. And I think for someone who has both of their parents in the religion, they've never set foot inside another place of worship, right. let alone sung a song or found out what they believe and why they believe it. All they know is that they have the chocolate bar and that everyone else, their chocolate bars, garbage. Mm. See, I was uh, in Vietnam, a medic in that war. Uh, I've seen what happens to humans when they're mangled. You see it on TV and some of that. Well, till you smell human flesh burning from a helicopter crash, people that look like uh, humans, like a hot dog on a grill, blackened and splitting open. Uh, I know what's coming in Armageddon. A lot of dead people. A lot of dead people. Coming up in part two. I've been lied to all these years. I've been manipulated. I've been coerced into a cult. Are you aware that there are cave paintings by Neanderthals which are about 60,000 years old? He was so smug. To be honest, I'm just not interested, mate. Like in the days of Noah, they took no note. Mm. And then the flood came and swept them away. You are not somebody to be trifled with. You are an unstoppable, unassailable, um, an insurmountable satanic demonic juggernaut. Have you heard of Australopithecus boci? This is a waste of time, Colin, but we're wasting our time. Play them at their own game. Barry's dead, but there's an excellent talk on Sunday. Please come, I beg you to come.
Let's hope the elders don't find out. Apostate! And the world is going away at escape velocity, and we're just standing here holding our ministry bag.